I am excited for today. I'm excited for it, excited you're here, and uh, glad that we can have an opportunity to still worship Jesus, even when we are blocks or miles apart. So starting in verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. Makes sense. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. I want to pause real quick before going to verse 12. What is that like? What is it like to think and to speak and to reason like a child? What's that like? I know one thing. I saw a list a few years back, and it said how to know if it belongs to a toddler. And I can't remember the list um, in detail, but there was a few that I remember. The first one is, if I have it, it's mine. If I used to have it and no longer do, it's mine. If you have it, but I want it, it's mine. If I've never thought of it before I saw it, it's mine. (laughs) If you tell me I can't have it, and I should never have it, but I want it, it's mine. (laughs) The list goes on and on, and as you could probably tell and infer through it, every situation ended with it as mine. Children are selfish by nature. They are. They're not meaning to be rude or hateful, but they just, they, they want what they want. They're learning how to understand life and how to care for people and, and things. I mean, it's enough to where in, in my son's preschool grade card, part of their pre-K report is do they is with the needs of others. It's something that has to be taught and learned. It's not something that we are innately born thinking about. How do they think and reason and and process and all these types of things and speak? It's very inwardly focused. But he goes on and says, when I grew up, I put away these childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God knows me completely. Today, as we we go through the the message, there's a couple questions I want you to think about as we move on. And and the first one is that, that God put on my heart as I was reading it for Valentine's Day and preparing was, are you partial to Jesus? Are you partial to him? In our culture today, when you use that phraseology or, or speak like that, you've heard it, where I, well, I'm partial to this person or I'm partial to this thing, it's almost a, a connotation of positive thought. It's a positive thing. But what God began to do in my heart and my mind about was that when it comes to him, to be partial to him is not a positive thing. He's not okay with us simply being partial. He wants us to be fully committed. He wants us to be completely in, all in, fully there. Partiality is not acceptable. And so we're about to watch a video. And as we watch it, I want you to think of this. What would it look like if we were all just partially committed to growing up? Babe, babe. What? I want to have cereal. I can't find the milk. Oh. Taylor, company's here. <laughs> Taylor, this is Amber's husband, DJ. Do you want to see my garage? Do you need help? No, I can do it myself. I can do it myself. Do it myself. Stop, stop, stop. Taylor, you need to go straight down. Okay, put it down, stop. Turn. I did it. Okay. Oh, babe, can you go get my wallet? Uh, can you please go get it? I forgot it. Oh, babe, can you get my socket set too? Honey, you don't need your socket set. I want to bring it. You... <sighs> Thank you. Okay, I got your socket set. No, not that socket set. The one fourth inch socket set. No. No, that's not the right one. No. Hey, what are you doing? Nothing. You have something behind your back? No. 
We're not grilling tonight. I already have a roast in the crock pot. Yeah, I know. Babe, put it back. Come on, come on. Uh, uh. Got it. Listen, we are going to Home Depot, but you are not getting any new tools. Do you understand? Yeah, I get it. We're not getting any new tools. I want a bandsaw. What are you doing? I'm fixing the curtain rod. Why did you take all of your tools out? I want to use all of them. <laughs> Nailed it. OK, honey, I'm done. I'm going to go watch my show. Do not put that in your mouth. Seriously, stop it. Taylor, you're gonna choke. Oh, uh, uh, uh. Knock it off. I'm still hanging out to it. Okay. Hey, babe, remember that marble? Mm-hmm. I ate it. I know. Taylor. Hey, where'd the guys go? Uh, I think they went outside. They play so good together. <laughs> and I don't like you, and you're not my best friend anymore, and I don't want DJ to come over ever again. Hey, whoa, what's going on, guys? He took my trimmer, and he won't let me play with my trimmer. Okay. Hey, DJ, is it okay if Taylor has a turn with the trimmer now? Thanks for making tacos, babe. Mm -hmm. mm. All right, I'm done. It was delicious. Now, ladies, before we keep going, please do not say that's exactly what it's like. We it, we're not that bad, okay? But really, what what would it look like in our own lives? I, I believe that's very very accurate. Um, if you watch, you probably laugh because you understand the accuracy of what that is like with toddlers. Um, in fact, it's to that point where when Anna and I go to the store, we kind of have to weigh what kind of mood we're in. Like, am I in the mood that I can deal with that? Or am I in the mood that I will go nuts if I'm in the store and that happens? So we find ourselves more often than not where it's, we are parked in the parking lot with me and three kids, keeping them distracted in the van while she goes into the store. Um, it, it's crazy. It's chaotic. But that's how kids process. That's what their, their, their mentality and thoughts are like. We just went to the store this last weekend, and Azariah has been saving up birthday money and Christmas money, and he's been itching to be able to spend it. <laughs> and, and like most kids, that's normal. But what's interesting is he really wants to spend it on us. And so he took the money, and we were getting some, some food for our Friday night dinner. It's the night that we get to let him have dessert, or we get to stay up a little bit later and watch movies, and they look forward to it every week. And so we went to uh, the, the market here in town, and... We got a dessert, but Azariah really wanted ice cream. Really wanted ice cream. And so I told him, I said, listen, if you're going to get ice cream, you have to pay for it. So sure enough, he gave me $5. And so we, we put the ice cream on the belt, and Joe Ash broke because it wasn't the ice cream he wanted. And he couldn't process and reason and understand that his brother's paying for it. So therefore, his brother gets to pick it. Uh, and so what do you do? You negotiate with the terrorist is what you do. And any parent who ever says, I don't do that, you are a liar or you are miserable. That are the only two options. You negotiate with the toddler terrorist. And what did I do? I said, you get to pick the next thing. <laughs> and, and after this conversation, that worked out and he came around. And, but that is what it's like to think and function and to reason and to live like a child. This video was a great description of it. And so what would it be like if, if we were okay doing that? It's absurd. There's no way that we would ever willingly choose to continue to, to live like a child in our daily lives. We'd never do it. We'd never stop in the middle of our workplace and fall on the ground and start crying because they told us no and we couldn't have our way. That wouldn't work. We might pout and mumble on the way out the car as we go to work because we're sick, but we don't, we don't throw huge tantrums. Life just doesn't permit it or allow it. And so because it would never happen, why are we okay living like that spiritually? Why are we okay remaining so partial? 
Why are we okay remaining so incomplete, so immature spiritually? Scripture even says that we drink milk, but there's a time that we have to eat the meat. There's a time that we have to increase what we're doing and grow. So today's message we, we, as we go forward is just simply called no longer partial. No longer partial. When will we no longer be partial? So a few more questions that we get going again is that I would begin to think about and, and process through this scripture, through these questions that God was giving me was when will we see everything with perfect clarity? Because he, he says there, he says, now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then... Then we will see everything with perfect clarity. When is then? When do we see this perfect clarity? And, and I've heard my entire life that it's the moment that we, we step into the presence of God and into heaven. But I'm not quite sure that's true. I mean, yes, we're going to have perfect clarity at that point. But Scripture tells us that God has great plans for us here and now. God has purposed us for something great, that he has given us the authority and the power that Jesus Christ had to do amazing things now. And so I believe that it can happen before we die. I believe it can happen before we step into eternity with Christ. When? When, when does that perfect clarity happen? And, and what does it look like? What will that completion look like? What would it be to be um, fully knowing everything fully and completely and to be fully known? I want to answer those questions by stepping back to the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13. It's not going to be on your screen, but listen. If you want to keep your Bible open or turn there on your phone or your Bible, you can do that very quickly. But I believe that this scripture has already answered those questions. A lot of times when we read the scripture, we like to break it up because they, the, the Bible has those nice little like titles over sections, and so we think that that new title separates what was written before and after it from each other, but it doesn't. They go together. So what? what is it? What does it mean to, to, to be complete, and when will that take place? Well, starting in verse 1 and 13, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. We've heard this a lot over our lives. It's, it's made its way into several songs. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will be passed away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When the perfect comes... Well, what is that perfect? When, when will we see all things with perfect clarity? Simply put, it's when we learn to love like God loves. When we learn to hold on to what the love of God is. When we learn to embrace what the truth of love is. We, we've heard over and over probably most of our lives that the love of God is, is what's called agape love. It is a full love. It is a immeasurable love. It is a perfect love. It, it cannot be built upon or broken down. It is, it is inconsequential. It, it's always there. It can't change. And we can never be loved more because we're loved at the utmost. We can never be loved less because it's not based upon our works or who we are. That's godly love. So how do we see everything with perfect clarity or when do we see that? We'll begin to love like Jesus loves. One of the things that breaks my heart about the thought process and the mentality, the, the childishness of our na national culture is when I see things posted that are shared so quickly and, and frequently with praise because it sounds good. 
And we see things like don't give to people who have constantly used and abused the gift. Don't waste time on ungrateful. But that's not godly love. That's not it. We are so quick to assume based upon patterns when somebody is lying or false or wrong. I heard a quote once that somebody had shared that they had heard from their father. And it said that his father as a child had ran into a man who was homeless and needed money. And his father wanted to give him money. And the son said, well, why, why would you do that? Don't you know he's probably going to use it for drugs or alcohol? And the father looked at him and said, what he does with the money I give him speaks about my character. But how I respond to a need speaks about mine. Godly love doesn't determine what's needed or accepted or good. It responds. We read here, it says that love bears all things, believes all things. When you look at that deeper, at to the original text and understanding what that scripture is saying, that it believes the best. It believes in the good. It believes in the truth. So when somebody comes and communicates to you, we're not presuming. We're not prejudicing that it's a lie or it's not real or true. We're taking it as word until it's proven otherwise. We are truly believing the best in humanity. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we just, you know, go guns ablaze and fully abandon. We still listen to the Holy Spirit and trust in God and follow his leading. But we don't believe the worst in people. And that's where we've been as a nation for too long. And where we've been even within the church culture for too long. Where we automatically believe the worst in those who believe differently. We automatically believe the worst in those who don't fully align up with how we think or believe or process. But that's not love. It's not love. Never once, even whenever the Pharisees stood against Jesus, when the nation raged and said, crucify him, did he ever speak against them? And did he ever assume the worst in them? And this is shown and made known when he's on the cross and he pleads with God the Father and he said, please forgive them for they know not what they do. It's a love of belief in humanity that even in their worst, even in their darkest hour, even in the worst of their moments, he saw the best and saw ignorance instead of hate. Why do we seem foggy or misled or misperceived? Maybe because whatever direction you're going in. Maybe if you're in a season, you don't feel like you're having clarity with what's in front of you. Maybe you're not dealing with it through the love of God. Maybe you're not responding to it with perfect and pure love. Maybe you're seeing a puzzling, foggy mirror because you're doing it your way. Maybe you're responding to the Holy Spirit or to a situation partially. You're partially there. You've given. You've spoken in the tongues. You've, you've given everything you've had. You've prophesied. You've understood mysteries and questions and curiosities. You've, you've moved impossible mountains. But everything still seems foggy. It's because you've done it all partially. You've done it with a partial love. You've done it with a love for God, but maybe not a pure love for them. We can't be a church that's partial. We can't do it. We can't be a church that is, is partially fulfilled, partially complete. We can't do it. If we exemplify to the world only a bit of Jesus... But most of us looks like them. We can't expect a change or a difference to be made. We can't expect a world to see a need for Jesus Christ or the church if the church isn't even demonstrating the fullness of Jesus Christ in them. No longer partial. At the beginning of the announcements, I read Acts 2, 42-47. I'm going to read it again 
Because this is what it looks like to be committed. This is what it looks like not to be partial, but to be complete, to fully know and to be fully known. They devoted, devoted. Already right there, God checks me. And he checks the church. And he checks the nation. He says, what are you devoted to? Because if he's writing my story about Jesus right now, can they use such a strong adjective for me? I hope and pray so. I believe so. But is there something else that takes precedence? Because if so, my devotion isn't to Jesus. My devotion isn't to his people. It's to my own wants. But they used a very strong adjective. They devoted, gave all of themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. The church wasn't something that they could just go to when they felt like they needed it or time was available. It was what they built their lives around. It wasn't, I have this event and this activity and this commitment, so someone there, I'm going to make time for the church. But they looked at their schedule and they said, hey, I, I don't have church at this moment. We can meet then. They were devoted to it, to the teaching and breaking of bread, to, the, to uh, fellowship and to the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the, apostle, and the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Devoted and it showed itself. It showed itself because when there's a devotion to what we do, when there's not a partiality, when there's not a partial closing or opening to what God is doing, when we are fully there and devoted, he moves and transforms and changes. When there was devotion and fullness and completion, then wonders and signs showed up. When there was completion and fullness and devotion, then there was growth and intimacy together. It says, and they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. It's amazing the sacrifices you make when you believe in the cause, when you believe in what you're doing. The old cliche is still true. I can tell you what you prioritize based upon your checkbook. What we give to is what we're committed to, what we're devoted to. And they show they're devoted to the church. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. What I exhort and implore and beg is that today you would check yourself with the Holy Spirit. Pray the prayers of David. Search me, O oh God, and know me. Show me. Show me what isn't aligned and isn't devoted. Show me where there's a partiality in my spirit. Show me where I'm not complete and full. And be open to receiving that truth and allowing the Holy Spirit to transform it in your life. It's not just something that's good to do. It's something that is needed. It is something that is desperately desired to be done in our lives through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. He's not searching and seeking a partial church. Could you imagine? Scripture says that I'm, I'm coming back for a church who is blameless, stainless, who is white and clean. It's not stained garments. Could you imagine if he came back and half the gown was pure white and the other was stained? It wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be enough that it was, most of it or half of it was starch white. It's the fact that even part of it was misprioritized and misplaced. 
Don't be stained. Don't be partial. Don't give some of what you have. Don't walk around in the spirit and in life like the grown man who's behaving like a toddler and, and thinking that we're pleasing God and we are mature and we are complete lacking nothing. He's seeking more. He's seeking greater devotion and greater commitment and, and greater uh, sacrifice in our lives. It's what he wants. And, and it's a process. It's growth. It's not going to happen all at once, but when we begin to look and commit to that path and that journey and that process, we honor God and we glorify God and he'll use us. He'll use us in the completion of who we are or becoming. My prayer for a decade or more has been that I would... I don't even care if it was leading, if it was just serving and being a part of a church that reflected Acts 2. Then I would have felt that I was giving all that God had given me to do, to be. That has been my heart's cry to be in the Acts 2 church. And I'm going to be honest. New life isn't an Acts 2 church at this point. It's not. It's not that we could never be. It's not that it's impossible. It's that we all together have some changes we have to make. We all together have some commitments that we need to make, some devotions that we need to change. And he's asking us each to, to reflect, to allow him to search us and bring it to light so that we can make those changes and commitments as they are made known. As they're made known. He wants to use us and he wants to, to transform us and grow us. And he wants to give us rewards in this life and rewards in life to come that can't perish or be burnt up. But if we do these things, if we bring him sacrifices to be judged that are done without love, that are done without purity and devotion, they will bring us to nothing. We will have gained nothing. As scripture says, this morning I ask you, who will devote themselves to no longer be partial? Who will search themselves to reflecting and allowing the Holy Spirit to show them where change and transformation and sacrifice needs to be? It's what God's searching for, it's what he desires, what he requires. And today, out of love, he has brought it before us and said, we need to make some changes. I need to make some changes. No longer partial.